Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Whitney. Um, thanks for coming out on what feels like the first day of summer um, to come inside and sit in the dark with us. Um, my name is Megan Hoyer. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here at the Whitney. And it's my great pleasure to introduce today's conversation between Zoe Leonard and Elizabeth Labovici. As Zoe predicted, the room is full of friends, so although they'll hardly need it, I'll offer just a few notes of introduction anyway. Um, the occasion, as I'm sure you all know, uh, for bringing these two amazing women together is, of course, Zoe's wonderful show, Survey, currently on view on the fifth floor. Looking across Zoe's career, the show highlights her engagement with a range of themes, including the history of photography, gender and sexuality, loss and mourning, migration, displacement, and the urban landscape. More than it focuses on any particular subject, however, Zoe's work slowly and reflectively calibrates vision and form. A counterexample to the speed and disposability of image culture today, her photographs, sculptures, and installations ask the viewer to re-engage with how we see. I want to thank Bennett Simpson and Rebecca Madelon from LA MOCA, where the show travels next. Um, and uh, they're the organizing institution. And I especially want to express my gratitude to uh, my colleague here at the Whitney, Elizabeth Sherman, who organized the presentation of the show, of the show that you see here. So Zoe Leonard and Elizabeth Labovici have known each other for a long time. As Zoe, <laughs> I don't even know how long. Um, and as Zoe's, and time, as Zoe's work shows us, is powerful. For the book that accompanies the show, Elizabeth wrote an essay titled, They Wanted Like Antigone Not to Break the Laws But to Find the Law, borrowing her title from Virginia Woolf. The essay is about a work of Zoe's that is not included um, in, in survey, her, her project for Documenta 9 in 1992. But that work has inspired a new piece, homage, which equally, quote, confronts challenges and contaminates vision with a critical vitality, as Elizabeth puts it. Both, when, both works, I think, will be woven into the conversation today. In fact, I know it because I've seen the PowerPoint. Okay. <laughs> um, an art historian and a critic, Elizabeth explores in her research books and lectures the articulation between feminism, gender studies, queer politics, LGBT activism, and the contemporary arts. She is the author, among numerous publications, of Femme Artiste, Artiste Femme, um, I'm Paris, I've, from 1880 to our time. Um, I can't do my numbers in French without practicing for sorry, um, which was published in uh, 2007. Um, and she animates the blog lebovisblogspot.com. She was an arts and culture editor for the newspaper Liberation from 1991 to 2006. And her most recent book is Ce que la sida m'a fait, What AIDS Has Done to Me, Art and Activism at the End of the 20th Century, published last year. Restoring the voices of the friends of the fight against AIDS, articulating the I and the we of then and today, examining facts and affects little known to the French and European public, analyzing the epidemic of consequential representation which followed the emergence of AIDS, such as the agenda of this book, conceived as a discourse of method in which the personal is always political and public and private spheres are closely intertwined. It very justly won the uh, 2017 Prix Pierre Dax, and we <laughs> and we have copies here uh, that Elizabeth will sign <laughs> following the program. Zoe and Elizabeth will also sign copies of Survey, and if you buy a copy of the the book, the exhibition catalog, if you buy a copy of it today, because I know you all already have your copies, you will get a, fr a free tote bag of, uh, inspired by homage. Um, and uh, we'll also have some refreshments. And so we invite everyone to help us celebrate um, after, the, um, after the talk. So please, enough for me, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Lavoisi and Zoe Leonard. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming here. I was very scared of like 
tripping through the floor <laughs> by going on the scene, but it reminds, it's always remind me of this beautiful scene of Je tue il elle, of Chantal Ackermann's Je tue il elle, where she arrives at the house of her lover and the first thing she does is like bam on the floor. <laughs> I love this scene. It did happen. I'm very, very... Yeah, we both made it up here. So, right. far, so far, so good. So far, so good. So thank you so much for devoting a part of your Sunday afternoon to come here. And um, thank you so much for inviting me for this conversation. I'm so excited and so happy to be here mm. with you. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being here um, and everyone for being here. Um, and as I learned today, what we worked on was our pouvoir point. <laughs> Um, so we have a lot of image for you yes. in our pouvoir point. Yes. Um, Don't you think we should actually maybe start? Maybe we should start it. Maybe we should, should we start, start it. it. Allez. Allez, hop. Yes. So we said we would actually show a few of these images. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I already forgot everything we agreed to do. Actually, stop there. That, uh -huh. That's the last one. Okay. So, with this work, we are getting into. It was. It's very interesting for for us visitors when we actually go and see the survey show. Um, we also um, are attracted or have to go and see other spaces of the museum, which are very strangely, the staff space, and there's a kind of, that's the, an architecture device. Suddenly, yeah. in, this, uh, in this museum, you can actually not go, because there are some glass doors, but actually see through the offices of the Whitney Museum, part yeah. of them at least. Yeah. And so look at the activities of uh, labor, of museum labor, of mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. Generally, we only see the guards. Here we see other, other parts of the museum labor. And you, your work is situated there. Yes. So can you expand a little bit on that? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so this is a work called um, Homage. Um, and it, uh, it takes Linda Nochlin's text, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, um, why Have There Been No Great Women Artists, a text that was written in 1972. Um, and the kind of the genesis of the piece, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about, um, so it, does, it relates to another work we're going to talk about later. Um, Elizabeth Sherman and I were trying to figure out how to adapt a work I'd made for Documenta 9, which was a site-specific work to this building. And we're having a lot of trouble figuring it out. Um, it's a work that belongs inside a permanent collection. And uh, in one of our many meetings, which took place in one of the conference rooms with the glass doors, uh, Elizabeth turned to me and said, um, could you ever see it hanging in relation to the museum, but not specifically in relation to the artworks in the museum? And I sort of looked around this conference room with the glass doors. And when you're in there having your meeting, you're looking out at the stairwell and the general, the general public, that's you and me most of the time, um, walking through. Um, and I was like, oh, you mean like in this room? And she's kind of nodded. And something got in my head. Um, and we sort of played around with that idea for many months. Um, and eventually, that didn't work. That mm -hmm. adaptation didn't work. But in the months of thinking about it, um, Elizabeth and I got really attached to those spaces, that they provided a kind of 
a, real, a unique vantage point within the museum and a bit of a tease because right. they promise transparency, but they really only give you a peek into certain pretty specific controlled places right. that you can see. Yeah. And it's also kind of an uncomfortable space for people working in the museum. There's certainly no glass wall to the director's office or to the chief curator's office, but the people that work in the general curatorial office, people can peer in right. and see them while they're working right. or when you're having a meeting. So it's a kind of an awkward, strange space, and we got really attached to it. Um, and at some point, we were working with some mock-ups, uh, and it was last fall. Um, the Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. had just happened, immediately followed by uh, Knight Landsman, the accusations, and him stepping down. And within days of uh, Knight Landsman stepping down, I actually looked up the dates, I don't remember, but within the week, um, I heard that Linda Nochlin had just died. And I didn't know her personally, but it felt like a huge loss and a kind of intense irony that at this moment of like this incredibly public breaking open of um, misogyny and lack of respect for women and, uh, and, and women being you know, sexually abused in their workplaces, I just thought, God, it just made such an impact. I was going back to Texas and I, I, I realized I hadn't read that essay in years and I wanted to read it again and printed it out, read it on the plane. And as I was reading it, I could kind of see it in the museum and called Elizabeth Sherman, the other Elizabeth, a lot of Elizabeths. Yeah. Um, and said, maybe this is the dumbest idea ever, but I kind of want to do it. What do you think? And um, it, it became a kind of mirror to that earlier work That's to, we're going to, to talk pitch about. this question back to the institution. Yes. And uh, both an homage to her, but also um, I think the reason why the title question still stings so much yes. is because things haven't changed enough. And so we made, the piece is not on the same floor as the show. It's on the third, fourth, sixth, seventh, and eighth floor. So it kind of forms a frame around the show that in a way illuminates the structure within which the show is happening mm -hmm. um, and the conditions under which historians like you, curators like Elizabeth, writers, labor of all kinds, the, what our working conditions are like when we're female. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, what is also when you reread the, little, the quotes that you actually make uh, in, the, in, your, in your work, it's incredibly, first of all, it's funny. I mean, some of the quotes are hilarious. And, you know, I didn't know very well Linda Nocklin. I met her at the end of, the, of her life, but she was hilarious. I remember at uh, the, you know, the little homage that was actually made in Paris, uh, Tamar Garb and Abigail Solomon Godot were telling us hilarious stories about Linda Nocklin crawling on the floor to see how it was, the point of view that was there to see a painting. I mean, she was like really funny. And uh, also the idea that still sticks to her essay which is the idea that it's not the problem, it's not the women artists that's the problem, it's the great, I mean, the idea of associating mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. great, the mm -hmm. idea of great women mm -hmm. artists, that mm -hmm. is a problem, a paradox, because mm -hmm. great goes with the male and it mm -hmm. makes, it fabricates the patriarchal order. Mm -hmm. And so that the problem was not adding or subtracting, subtracting women to the crowd of artists, it was about mm -hmm. something else. It was about rethinking, criticizing the mm -hmm. institutions. Exactly. Exactly. and the institution of art history. Exactly. And I think it's really interesting because, of course, I mean, the, the last, um, you know, the last uh, slide that we actually show shows that very, very well. Mm -hmm. And it shifted totally uh, mm -hmm. the idea of what we could do with those problems. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really nice mm -hmm. to have it looking at the people in the institution and through the glass mm -hmm. looking at the, at the spectators mm -hmm. who find themselves asking those questions. Huh? And I, I mean, for me, reading that essay for the first time in my early 20s, yeah. um, what 
struck me about it, because I'm sure it was very important to you as well as an art historian, yeah, sure. it's a complete rethinking of the field. Yeah. And part of what's so powerful in that essay, rereading it, certain things feel dated, but most of it feels hot out of the oven, like fresh like it was right. yesterday. And partly because she argues against defending mediocrity. She says there are some female artists from before the 20th century that we can say are very good, but do we want, really want to argue for them as great? Um, and she also argues against the idea of the exception. Everyone's like, well, what about Agnes yeah. Martin? What about Louise Bourgeois? And she's like, no, it's not about exceptionalism. What we need to do is take our focus away from the few people who've managed to break through and exactly. look at the institutional structures that allow for a certain kind of growth. Like that's what it takes. Um, the title, homage, has a kind of a double meaning, which I was thinking about you, actually, because a lot of Elizabeth's um, writing, um, my French is terrible, so I have a hard time with her writing anyway, but um, I mean, whoa. Um, Google Translate, um, which is like, with your writing is like crazy, because a lot of Elizabeth's work turns on wordplay. But the word uh, homage, um, has a kind of, um, the, the common meaning is, of course, to pay homage to someone, to, to uh, show respect and um, uh, to kind of make a monument to them. Um, but it also, it comes, it's actual um, etymology, it comes from feudal times. And to pay homage was literally the name of what serfs would pay to their masters, to their, and but it was an exchange. You would give your rice or your wheat or your goods, whatever homage you gave to your, the landowner, and in return they would protect you. And so that was a really important title for me within this institution. Um, I see Elizabeth <laughs> Sherman like giggling in the front <laughs> row because <laughs> we're sort of like this piece is both complicit with and uh, straining against the museum. So like sort of sliding this piece into the museum um, within accepting the forms and formats of the museum, using right. this little aperture that Renzo Piano had offered us, but using that to kind of like hopefully make a fissure within um, an institution that's considered a very progressive one. So Yeah, very interesting. And I would add, you know, French pun, which I didn't do. Bring but, it on. Uh, homage, you know, has two M's in French, and, you know, homme, man. Oh, totally. Oh. So in the, femini in the early feminist times, we would call homage, in feminism words, famage. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Totally. Totally good. Should we go? Yes, to our we next? should go. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've got about like nine and a half hours of material, just <laughs> FYI. Do I do, should I do really? that? Yes. Okay. Should I actually show the whole? Yeah. Let's do that. See, they look a lot brighter there than up there. Do you see anything? <laughs> Maybe we should stop here. Okay. Huh? Sure. Show yeah. you afterwards? No, we can do that. That's me. Yeah, That's with you. Me. It's you. So this is a work that actually changed my life. So I really have to, yeah, it's true. I was there as a, this was the first time I was doing that for Liberation. I arrived in Castle. I, it's an enormous exhibition, as you know, that happens every five years in Castle began in the late 50s as a kind of gesture for Germany to reconciliate with culture after the war. And uh, so I, I enter the Neue Galerie, which was at the time uh, the museum for painting, um, and uh, had a collection of painting, mainly of the 17th, 18th, 19th century, 
I went through the collection for the essay afterwards and I discovered it was mainly, it's not, the, actually it's not the great artist myth, it's like middle artist, <laughs> ah, moyen, we would say in French. And in the collection, uh, there's a, I noticed also there are families of artists like, you know, fathers, sons, grandson, like there is mm -hmm. one family of the local artists called the Tischbein, and there's a lot of Tischbeins in the, in the collection. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so I enter a museum with the collections, and what do I see? Well, I see something that actually changed my life. I see that the museum is not full, but in a way, there are some voids in the museum because it lacks something. There are some voids that have been made in the museum, and within those voids, as you noticed, there are some photographs of genitalia, black and white, confronting you at the height of the eye with Zoe's usual method, which is just a glass over uh, the photograph, and which contrasts totally with the framed works, which are bigger. So immediately there is a problem that we actually question, that we actually see in your survey, which is a question of scale. Suddenly the scale of the photographs totally contrasts with the frame of the paintings, the gilded frames, and with also with all the apparatus of the museum that at the time was there, you know, the, 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 the color of the walls, their shiny quality, the, the kind of pastel colors they have, even the hanging device that were still there to hang the paintings. Mm -hmm. and, and as the curtains. The curtains, the floor, the fact that you can't sit. I mean, you know, all these things are mm -hmm. there and then so something happens which is very important. So as you might know, well, what did you do? <laughs> um, basically, um, I mean, it was a long process to get to what I ended up doing, but um, in one wing of the museum, there are several other wings in the center. There's actually a, a big Joseph Boyce installation and there's other things upstairs. But in this one wing of like 18th, 19th century paintings, um, I removed every painting that didn't have a woman as a central figure. Um, and actually most of the paintings in that wing did. There were a couple of portraits of men, one or two battle scenes, and I think a couple of landscapes. But the dominant theme throughout were these um, uh, kind of narrative paintings that involved the female figure, a really high percentage of them being nude or partially nude. Um, so I removed all the paintings that didn't have a, a woman as a central figure. And in those voids and those empty, the spaces created by that, um, I introduced this group of photographs. Um, so it sort of made a, um, a rhythm throughout. I think in the gallery was seven galleries that led into one another. And um, the first and last I didn't touch. There was another artwork from a male sculptor, I can't remember his name now, uh, sadly, in, in one. But in the five intervening rooms, that's where I sort of did the intervention. So you had an example of one room that was not, um, that hadn't been changed, and then these five rooms that had been. Um, and I think, I don't know, I was kind of interested in Huh. like on the one hand, stating again something that's glaringly obvious, the, the female as a figure incredibly present, um, but yeah. drawing attention to that the female as a maker is glaringly absent, like not a single painting painted by a woman in the whole lot of them. Um, and the kind of tension that that created um, right. I also really wanted to, I was interested in kind of experimenting against the critiques that were happening at that time in my life. It was the early 90s. I was very involved in AIDS activism and, um, you know, had come out and was involved in like queer activism and, 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 and learning about feminism. But something that it sort of, um, it was almost like a very, um, an experience I'd had since being a really young child of going to these museums and even as a kid like I knew 
this is where I wanted to be and this is kind of where I belonged. But um, yeah. I, even as a kid, I remember like asking the names of different painters and, and noticing that they were all men and being like, how do you get in here? You know, do you have to be a model? Is that the only way to get in? And I remember learning about Belt Moiseau and um, um, Marie Cassatt. Marie Cassatt. And I was like, oh my God, I was yeah. so excited as a little kid. Again, I think, um, you know, Lyndon Auckland would argue about exceptions there. But I wanted to do something to kind of um, animate, to use a word that you use a lot. Um, to kind of not just like to just flog the same thing about, oh, the male gaze. And I wanted to actually kind of animate what was happening in the paintings and open up both a sense of uh, what was missing and what was overly stated, but also the potential for the, all the female gazes from painting to painting to kind of become in dialogue with one another. Um, it's it's like often written about, yeah, like she's sort of slyly looking to the side. And there are. And it's there, a portrait and a portrait, exactly. in a way. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think a lot of the way it was written about at the time, it was as very angry and, you know, the super hardcore feminist, angry activist work, which it was. But I think there's also an element of play and pleasure and desire that there's like a lot of, there's a lot about hands. Like there are several with like a woman's um, hands in her lap. And this woman, like her hands are there. There's a hand there. Right. There's another, is it in this? No. Maybe not in this group. There's another, there's several paintings where hands are like someone sitting very sort of proper with their hands in their lap. And so there was also a lot of formal play with the figure, with the body, with different forms of representation. And with all these sidelong glances, when you took all the battle scenes and the men out of the picture, the gazes from these female figures in the paintings were moving towards each other. So it was, an, it was also about another kind of a potential, which I thought was really funny, and no one really picked up on that. Um, um, but no. but it, it's also because of that that we met, because yeah. it was maybe a year later mm -mm. that you came to New York and wanted to... Two years maybe. Two years yeah. maybe, it was like 93, 94, something. Um, so in a, in a way, it changed my life, too. Oh. Um, uh, Elizabeth asked to do an interview with me, and I was super paranoid and guarded and, like, really wanting it, but also really, like, uh, shy and, and, and um, n nervous about giving an interview. And we met in a cafe, and I remember so well, like, walking in the cafe and seeing you from across the room and thinking, oh, this is not going to be a problem <laughs> at all. <laughs> And we sat down, we had a great conversation, yeah. and literally at that, uh, at that meeting, by the end of it, I was like, I hope this person is my friend for the rest yeah. of my life. Wow. Yeah. It, it's, it's going pretty well so far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the conversation is continuing as the conversation is here in, in, the, in, the, in the installation. It's so interesting. Yeah. I think also by by suddenly showing these voids, mm -hmm. not by respecting the you know the space, by respecting the scale differences, and it's also a way to show how the museum could be. Yeah, yeah because yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I I always say that. I hope I'm not perturbating the Whitney by saying that, but you know, museum hate voids. Mm -hmm. It's obvious. They w exhibition spaces. It's impossible that they're not, you know, f like like a film, filled until the end. You know, mm. you know, the interruption. I think, you know, like when you see Derek Jarman's Blue, for instance, suddenly there is something that happens. But, and it's true. Something happens when suddenly you ask the question of what's there. What 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 is the aim of the museum when it f always fills, not packed, but fills the exhibition rooms. Mm -hmm. And if we change a little bit that, what mm -hmm. happens? Well, there is a possibility for us to enter. to enter. And when there is a possibility for us to enter, look, it looks really different. Things are happening. Gaze are changing. Desire 
is also changing. Questions about desire mm. as, are there. And I think one of, yeah, you're, you're talking also about something which is, of course, heavily loaded politically and mm. particularly at the time, but also, you know, a question that everybody should ask uh, mm. to themselves uh, going into a museum, which is, you know, where is my desire? Mm. What am I, what mm. is the relation of my desire to mm -hmm. the works I see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do with that? Mm -hmm. How am I going to respond? And all these questions suddenly enter the museum. Mm. And mm. this is also mm. how the conversation yeah. began. And also I think um, related to that desire is the sense of one's own agency. You know, when it's all laid out for you densely like a textbook and you just feel like you have to like, uh, uh, and like, look, this uh, the way it's, y you're less aware of your own, how your desire motivates you, how your curiosity, the amount of agency that you have to go here and then there to change your perspective. Right. I think those two things are really related. Do should we, we have go to continue? To, yeah. I think we should, oh. you know, so. Oh. This is great. You have to talk about this. Yes. This is Elizabeth. So you see there's also something about showing these genitalia, these photographs of genitalia, trans genitalia, in, within the rooms of Castle. It's also, you know, bringing up a whole history of a whole literary, poetic, cinem you know, filmic history of the... I would say the cunt that talks, should I say that? Should I say that like that? Yeah. Let's say it say like, it that. like okay. that, okay. Um, because, let's say it like let's that. Let's say it like that. You, know. you will forgive my English, of course. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will forgive your uh, English. So, in, even in the Middle Ages, there is an association of women's genitalia to a question about who, by which lips, which is the mouth that is saying the truth in women's discourse. And since the Middle Ages, there's been a, dis, you know, a poetic tradition and a novelist tradition in the 18th century where women's genitalia speak. <laughs> and actually, this is where they say the truth more than their own. So we go back to Linda Nochlin, actually. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole discussion about this truth within women's below mouth or upper mouth. Mm -hmm. So the question of the lips are very interesting, and the question of the mouth is very interesting. And I love this illustration. This is an illustration, actually, for uh, Denis Diderot, you know, one of our first art critics, and who wrote a lot of I would say erotic novels or novels that talk about the body and the eroticism of the body and desire. And this one is my favorite, Les Bijoux Indiscrets, so the indiscreet jewels. And one of these il original illustrations uh, is this incredible um, figure, which is again inverted, where the skirt mm -hmm. goes over and, and suddenly you have at the place where the legs are and the sex, the, the, you know, the genitalia should be a head. Mm -hmm. I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, the reflection you introduce in, in your work, you know, I'm, I'm, I also, of course, we're also reminded to think about all those pornographic movies mm -hmm. of the early 60s, 70s, 70s actually, you know, in what, there is one in French called The Sex That Talks, and which is indeed, and uh, you know, and also uh, of course Deep Throat, I mean all, there is a whole tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And John Grayson remember that very well, of course, mm -hmm. in his mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. uh, about patient zero, zero patients, yeah. where there are indeed genitalia and <laughs> and asses that actually have a long discussion. <laughs> and I was actually, after we were looking at this um, this morning, I was thinking about Narcissister. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. You know, and exactly. like, the, 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 and the, the shock of that, like the still, the like, um, should we move to the, yes, this related to that? Yes. So that brings us to this, which relies on that same kind of 
um, I don't know, pun or yeah. possibility. Um, so this is a poster that um, I was a member of an artist collective, artist activist collective called Gang. Um, and yeah, read my lips before they're sealed. Um, the horrible irony, much like the Lyndon Auckland text coming around again, is that we're actually this week uh, dealing with the potential for the gag order to come into effect again. I'm just like, no. I'm like, we're going to be like thousands of years old. I swear to God, and we're going to be like, well, here it is again. I no, seriously, this is like this, where this is where our government is again. Is a, a no, yeah, basically this, basically essentially the same exact thing that any funding, any organization that receives any federal funding cannot, it's not just perform abortions, it's you cannot speak yeah. of them. Um, and that, you know, so the whole um, connection here to um, where we're gonna start moving also is into silence equals death and like the power of the voice, whichever mouth you're using to say what it is that you wanna say, um, and the, the kind of, um, oh, the, 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 the prohibitions around speech yeah. and the shame associated with um, not knowing or being or not trusting what you have to say and this kind of the intense um, power in insisting on silence, right? Like right. what what that does to be quiet. Um, so, yeah. yeah, invisibility and silence and the fact that I, I like also the fact that it is a poster, which means that, you know, in mm. very long time ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there was no internet. There was yeah. just, you know, you yeah. had, on the in order to inform people, you have to have posters, you have to have this information, you have to use those means, those technologies to get alternative information exactly. to what exactly. you know, the media tell you. Exactly. And so this is a poster. This is something that yeah. actually does, um, you know, yeah. does this public um, information. Yeah. And I think it's very important to say that too. Yeah. And it's really related, I think, to, it really goes to sort of to your book. <laughs> this is Elizabeth's book, Ce que le sida m'a fait, or What AIDS Has Done to Me. Um, the interior of the cover, both back and front, is one continuous long, it's this. Um, but Elizabeth's book sort of happens in the gutter, in the middle of this piece. I'm so it's, happy about um, that. <laughs> so I don't know, is anyone from Fierce Pussy here today? All right, Joy, Carrie, is Brody here too? Um, so Joy and Carrie and I and Nancy Brooks Brody um, Joya Pisala, Kari Yamaoka, and I made this work. It's a, an adaptation of a work that we had made together and that's gone through several different iterations. And we made this iteration for Elizabeth's book to run as a kind of a body around, to kind of hold her book and for her book to sit in the gutter of it. And so I wanted to ask you about um, writing your book and kind of for you, the relationship between activism and art writing, between your blog and being in the street, you know, we've been talking about kind of how my activism slid into my art practice. How did that work for you? And what was okay. it like working for Liberation at the time? And how much of a voice did you have at the time? And I know it's a big question. It's but a big question. I, I think I want to you know, to try to think about it now, okay? okay. Um, you know, I wanted to do this book, I was asked to do this book, and I didn't know how to proceed, you know, because it's a problem. When you want to think about the relation of AIDS and an artistic practice, where do you begin, where do you end? What mm. does it mean? What does it mean to isolate one practice and say this is good and the others are bad? No, I'm not doing that, you know. Linda Nocklin, think about Nocklin. I, don't, I didn't want to like isolate the good ones and then throw away the bad mm -hmm. ones, the mm -hmm. ones that weren't exactly in the line of what 
we were or not advocating. And so my principle for writing this book is that everything, everyone, every object has been affected by the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. That was my principal thing. Mm -hmm. And so going back to my writings, I looked at, you know, things that I had written during that time, and even the ones that weren't tackling that question, you know, they were talking about inachievement, about mourning, about inevitability, about all these things. And suddenly I was looking at the titles and I was saying, oh my God, but this is, I'm talking, it's crazy. So I went back to these articles and uh, what I did is I chose some and I decided to entirely rewrite them, mm -hmm. period. Not because they were good or bad, but because I wanted to, you know, to do what actually activism had taught me which was to make connections, mm -hmm. which, was, which was to think politically those connections. And so a text is interesting because it connects with other questions, other meanings, and then this is how I tried, at least I tried, to uh, rewrite it. And I also wanted a book which connects, of course, to, to your shows and to the documenta thing, which was not a thesis. Mm. Um, I have no thesis about the, you know, how can I have a thesis? I don't, I don't want to say something, but it's written in like a fabric which is very much broken. The chapters don't make a, a chronological narrative. Mm -hmm. It's not never linear. There are lots of voids. There are lots of things that I don't say. That you, so it's like, and you know, you can start whenever you want. So it's really, the rhythm is very, very important for me. Very, very important for me. So it's really, it went like that. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I, um, we were talking about this this morning that um, there's a kind of um, similar set of problems and a task yes. in the idea of a memoir and the idea of a retrospective or a, or, or a survey show. Right. Um, and how does one kind of resist or work against, not in a withholding or a stingy way, but how do you work against the kind of hierarchical nature of history as it gets told? And I was thinking so much about how um, in, in your life as both an art critic and an art historian, um, and an activist, you've sort of um, raised your voice um, against the hierarchical and kind of um, uh, the nature of institutions to kind of calcify and to make history grand and to make it stable and to kind of, um, it's sort of, um, yeah, heroism. it's kind of the, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And this kind of the question of, you know, the, you know, do you want the seat at the table? Um, do you want to enter the canon or do you want to overthrow the canon? So then in the charge of making a memoir, how do you sort of like m tell what you need to tell but find a form? And we were talking about all these recent models, um, Douglas Kremp's sure. beautiful book, Greg's The AIDS, uh, Greg Bordowitz, The AIDS Crisis is Ridiculous. Yvonne Rayner's uh, feelings are facts. Um, there's a, quite a number of other people that we'll remember as we go along. But Samuel these, Delaney. Sam Delaney, yeah. Like how to find these, these um, that in their form can actually, um, is that for you? <laughs> um, can actually act as something that destabilizes the, the nature of history and that presents it as something that's kind of still sliding around and, and animate and moving and, and that, that that also, um, it gives it the potential to be active in the present, which is, It's right? a crucial question. So we're going to continue yeah, and yeah. try to, to, to I don't keep, have a yeah, big okay. answer. But yeah, it's a crucial question, absolutely. Yeah. 
I think it's uh, so we go. It's we what is re that, really interesting yeah. by by talking about that in our conversation yeah. is that we go back. I mean, it's hard to say that here, but we go back to the question of form. And we'll okay, should we go back to here for a second no, then? No, no, we'll go back to the question of form. We'll go we'll back, go back later. there afterwards. Okay. Yeah. A par so a kind of parallel life. There's Elizabeth. Uh, in the middle of the book, um, there are few a number of interviews of lesbians that were involved as activists in the AIDS crisis in ACT UP. And I really wanted it to be the center of the book. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, here we are. Here we are with um, two um, two pictures. One is a poster by Fierce Pussy. One I'll talk a little bit about, and then you'll go back to Fierce Pussy. I hope is one of the illustrations of my book. It's a banner that was made uh, for the LGBTQ etc. A plus Pride in Paris. And it's, uh, if you know Paris, it's on the, near Saint-Germain-des-Prés. And there's a lot of people. But what I really like about this banner, I'm very proud about, about this banner. It says proud, by the way, proud z, is that as you can notice, um, you know, generally a banner, you hold it and it faces the public. It faces the people who look at the banner. Here, as you can notice, it's not that. It's an arc de triomphe. People are getting into the banner. They're getting underneath the banner. So the proud, the pride mm -hmm. is there. And secondly, it is, um, mm -hmm. if you know French, it's not, it's fier at the, in the feminine uh, voice. So it has a little E. It's called the silent E, by the way, you know, in France, which <laughs> says a lot about what the feminine is in French. Mm -hmm. Silent mm -hmm. E's. Um, what, what I really like, you know, and it's, a, it's also something I'm very proud of, you know, generally, is every text, everything that came from Act of Paris at one moment at least was in the feminine voice. In French, we have this problem. We have, we, it's very, very gendered language and binary, unfortunately, gendered language. There is a masculine voice and a feminine voice, and it's everywhere. You have to use it all the time. And so to put, you know, there's a big discussion right now because the French Academy doesn't want uh, the grammar to be inclusive and actually mm -hmm. to make, because a lot of people me included, and my book is written like that, have added the feminine to the masculine, uh, you know, mm -hmm. other types of, um, of voices in every word, sort of. So it mm -hmm. makes the books a bit long to read, but then it's much more interesting because, you know, suddenly the language opens up. But there, to put the feminine into a kind of universalizing mm -hmm. device is, I mm -hmm. think, very, very interesting. Also, the fact that everybody you know, every activist is there speaking in the feminine, mm -hmm. in the feminine, particularly gay men, for instance, um, is also very interesting in relation of, you know, the mm -hmm. play with the language, a kind mm -hmm. of finding back a notion of camp that, you know, mm -hmm. has been revived through this way. So it's also very, very interesting to use that kind of feminine. I'm mm -hmm. very proud of that. And what mm -hmm. about, I'm also Beautiful. very proud to be a lazy, butch, pervert girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Both. <laughs> and proud and fier. Yeah. These are a, really incredible. Yeah, that is a classic. Classic. And we still don't know. No. <laughs> are you a boy or a girl? Are you a fact or fiction? I mm. think the transition could be there. Mm. Um, mm. Amongst the incredible work, you know, we sh that have been produced at the time and are, that are active against AIDS and also that put that fight within a museum work, museum mm -hmm. labor, using the walls is the, the group material 
uh, eighth timeline, mm -hmm. which has been shown, you know, in three occurrences, in four occurrences also, in the pages of a number of magazines through visual aids, and also at the Whitney Biennial. Mm. Yeah, what I, like what I think really incredible. Well, it's a model for, for, for my book. It's a model for what I was saying, mm. uh, which is what is affected by AIDS or not. You know, what is what is living with AIDS mm. or not. And the group materials idea is re revi revising the idea of mapping, revising the idea of time, mm -hmm. doing it actually backwards, right. but also revising the idea that some, you know, some, some facts are more factual because they're supposedly mm -hmm. coming from the media, mm -hmm. the news, their statistics. Mm -hmm. They're supposedly more objective than artworks. And reciprocally, um, mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that, you know, in, in a time where the idea of fake news is so, but it is also fake news that we were listening mm. in the yeah, AIDS crisis. Well, yeah. And figures, it could also be fake figures. I mean, mm. it could, but it, it also the interaction, the contradiction between this separation that one should actually do. And in my, the, 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 the occupation I had at the time, which was, which was working with the press, being a journalist, mm -hmm. you're supposed to know that, you know, one is a fact and the other is a, no, of course not. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the notion of um, this notion was totally turned over by this, uh, mm -hmm. this work mm -hmm. by group material, which I mm -hmm. think is really, mm -hmm. really important and mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. because of that also. And the other amazing thing that this work does that you write about is how it spatializes it. Um, and so you're not just seeing it as a list of facts in a, in a frozen form, you're seeing it in space. And right. that there's the linear aspect on the wall, but there are also all these objects that are, and many, quite a number of videos. So things that also break the kind of temporal continuity or break the rhythm of it, and that suggest um, different kinds of branching in terms of how people were affected. Yes. Um, there's something in, there's this one chapter in your book, it, it's, I think it's sort of not a bad segue here, um, about um, cleaning out your closet, which is, um, uh, in French, it's le placard, it's a male. Um, uh, and um, so there's this pun about coming out of the closet and coming out of the closet, and there's this really great chapter that in a way is exemplary of a lot of how the form that your book uses where Elizabeth is like, you know, once a year I have this habit where I clean out my closet and I get rid of whatever. And then there's this like list of different things. And it's like this suntan lotion and there's like... Did um, it work? That didn't work. There's the thing about like a concealer. It's concealed nothing. Clinique like, doesn't <laughs> work. <laughs> and all these different products that were either left by someone else or brought somehow arrived in your closet or... Um, and it's this sort of really... Um, Without, rather than there being a heavy handed essay about like how the personal is political, it's this completely like humorous inventory of the um, important and useless things in our closet. And it, and it completely does away, it's like reveals, um, you know, vanity and these, you know, oh, these tweezers and, you know, all these different things that, that we, we use as queers. That we use. <laughs> Oh, right, you talk about like underwear that makes your butt look good and like all, like line different at the time. like f different fashion of the time. And so it has this lightheartedness and this and exposes a lot of things that we continue to be ashamed of even when we're out of the closet. And it's a sort of beautiful yes. um, pun and kind of idea about um, the personal as political in the most minute kind of way. It's really yeah, but also, you know, suddenly in the picture arrive objects that I've never been able of throwing away. Of course, it's the object that I got from people who are dead. And I have little powders and, you know, little things that you can't throw away. Absolutely can't, mm -hmm. cannot throw away. Even, you know, there are really magical objects, actually, that, you know, you mm -hmm. can't throw away. 
little, you know, medication, stuff like that, that you've t you, you have inherited somewhat and that you keep. And so it's also an incredible, um, potent uh, mover for memory. Mm. I have to say for yeah, my book, I've been very yeah. much, uh, I read an incredible book in French by um, a philosopher, Belgian philosopher, who is great. You should absolutely translate and read her if she's not translated. Her name is Vinciane Desprez. She wrote incredible things about rat experimentations, how rats fall, have a kind of transference uh, relating to the, ex the person who experiments with them, and so they, ha they, they change the results of the, ex you know. Wait, that's, what? Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible <laughs> book about rats. So they develop <laughs> a relationship with the, I mean, it's science studies, and she actually went in, a, you know, she really studies, and it's, it's a field trip. And so there is a discovery that, you know, the, the, the animals that are experimented upon, which is horrible, but they develop a kind of re transference relationship towards mm. their, the person who tests them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they can love or hate that person, and so the results change. Mm. Whoa. Well, so she wrote that. She wrote many, many things about animals, but she also wrote a very beautiful book about how dead people manifest themselves, and that we should take very seriously how they talk to us, and how, indeed, the, the whole, the, she changes basically the whole idea of what we think about mourning and what mm. Freud has told us about mourning and mm. what it means to mourn. And she talks about, um, we should really take seriously what happens. And this placard, this closet, is one of the mm. discourses. Mm. Um, mm. But it's also bringing us to, our, to, I think, to Philippe Thomas. Right? Yeah, to another yeah. subject, which is the archive. You know, when you begin an archive, you do an inventory. And um, in my book, I have a, ch a very long chapter, as long as um, the one that's devoted to Documenta, about an artist called Philippe Thomas, who, whose work I absolutely love. He also taught me so many things about. Yeah. Should I go through the, yeah. do you want to go through these ones of, of yeah. Philippe so, Thomas' work is not that well known in this country, he, which I hope is something that's going to change. Yeah, well, the, the, the first reason a little bit? Why, it's not sh why it's not very known is that his name disappeared. The, 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 the protocol of, her, of his work was to do in his work what Pessoa had done in literature, which is to bring forward uh, authors that wouldn't be his name, but that would actually endorse the work and publish the work or show the work under their own name, which in the contract, the, the question was also to be inventoried in their own name. So you see here, for instance, it's a work by Edouard Merino, Insight, 1989. So the, the author's name is going to be inventoried in any museum, gallery, <laughs> collectors, so whatever collection, under another name than the name of Philippe Thomas. <laughs> so he disappeared. And I remember fairly well, you know, I'm talking, I think anecdotes are interesting and important. So I'm telling you, there is a very famous art dealer called Marc Blondeau. He signed one of Philippe's work, and one day I was in a gallery, and there was this gallerist who was saying, I'm really trying to get in touch with Marc Blondeau. And Philippe was there, and you know, it's very, it's strange. So what is happening with the disappearing author in an age where the author is disappearing? What mm. is happening, you know? What is happening with the very famous Barthes, you know, the death of the author, with this very famous Foucault, the, function, the author function, what is happening with that in a moment where this is effective? Mm, this is also mm, something mm. which is really important in this work. I mean, what kind of phantomatic presence and how can we actually revive mm. this, this name, this, this disappeared name? Mm -hmm. This is also a number of questions which, which are asked in, his, in, in, in Philippe's work. Um, so not only the authors are endowed with a work, but as in Pessoa, Pessoa invented heteronyms, which are names in, uh, with which the works 
uh, novels are actually authored, but then the author have a life of their own. You mm. know, the authors, they live, they have a life and the, their books have a life and they sometimes enter a conversation. Mm. So it's all that that Philippe exported or imported mm. or paralleled in his work. Mm. Well, it has a lot, I think, to do actually with the silent E. Um, and exactly. maybe I could also connect it back to one second for the, the this inside cover that Joy and Carrie and Nancy and I, Fierce Pussy, did, which is this text, which is, if he were alive today, he'd be standing next to you. If he, This sort of like evocation of the absent, and that that's a kind of... Um, for our kind of generation, we're constantly aware of these silent ease all around us, right? Like all of our um, comrades and colleagues and friends who they're always present for us and we wish you could all meet them. But um, this, so this kind of the slippage of the authorship is both, um, strikes me as both a kind of um, political move in terms of kind of capitalism and the art market and, slipping through that system, but also because he's no longer with us, the, this way that um, the silent E of him kind of also in a way expands through yes. all these other people. Um, and there's like one in your apartment that is, you know, by you, right? Mm -hmm. The, because that's the conceit, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no. Um, the thing is, we so how did you invoke, you know, this disappearing author in now? So that's a question that I try to equivocate so, to something that was actually parallel to Philippe's uh, working, uh, which is queer theory mm. and the closet. Exactly, because the closet is never open and never closed. You know, mm. it's always opened and closed. And what F. Kosofsky Sedgwick, who is this incredible, um, incredible writer, uncovers for us through Proust, for instance, is that, you know, the closet is, is a movement from the in to the out, but it's never something stable. It's never mm. something essential. Mm. It's never you're totally in or you're totally out. Mm. When you are out, you in something else. <laughs> you in maybe somebody else. Those tweezers. <laughs> Those tweezers, for instance, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that to talk about Philippe Thomas is the same thing. It's the same jouissance of thinking the in and the out of the closet. So we buy his fiction, and we totally enter his fiction, and we think about all these names are having a life of their own and being different authors mm. into a conversation mm. in, in mm. each of the shows. Or, and we also buy the fact that there is somebody who has been actually doing these things, mm, mm. articulating this theater. Mm, mm. And so it's two levels mm -hmm. we have to maintain together. Mm -hmm. And this is what is, I think so brilliant about mm, Philippe mm. Thomas. And it really relates to this thing, the, uh, this question about Sorry. finding forms and formats that allow one to destabilize the archive even within the creation of the archive or to kind of destabilize exactly. the telling of a history. Like, it's crazy. So in 1988, he opened in New York at Cable Gallery, an agency called Ready Mates Belong to Everyone. So under the name of the agency, there is a number of shows authored by different people, even by a museum, the Musée d'Art Contemporain de Bordeaux, the CAPC, which is called Pale Fires, an homage to Nabokov. And it's a whole exhibition about the history of museum devices. Anyway, and then when, uh, you know, at the moment, at a certain moment, the agency had to close. It closes. It closes in 1993. Mm. There is a ceremony for closing the agency. But then the agency reopens, closed, or <laughs> closes, reopened, at the uh, Museum of Geneva, the MAMCO, where it is now, uh, you know, archived. It's still there? And shown. Yes. Okay. So the interesting thing about it is that it's exactly that. It's exactly that closet which is open and closed, closed but open, and you see the remnant of work, of labor, of an agency, you know, packages, you know, right. timelines, things right. to do, 
you know, and all are parts of the narrative of a work, and they right. make the work, and they're even shown, even here at the Guggenheim, I think, were shown for the exhibition that was called Premises uh, in 1995. So it's a closed agency which is shown open in an exhibition in a kind of status where I think also, I think it's very mel melancholic, and mm. it's, it's also all these affects which are charging this kind of exhibition. But again, mm. I think it's really interesting to see it as, a, mm. as, as you know, mm. a way to unlock um, some kind of way into the archives. You mean we are, like, we have to go, kind okay. Kind of, well, I mean, Megan, oh. what do you think? Should we give it a few more minutes? Um, I don't think it is. Oh, is no, it? No, 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 no. <laughs> but this was one of our possibilities for stopping, right? Oh. So we could go, Shh. should we stop it with this? Or we should we stop with do... Roland Barthes. Okay. <laughs> and we had many, many Just... things to say about what could have been in the documentary show. <laughs> Well, there's one thing I know that I really want to fit in, okay. which is kind of, um, maybe I want to skip to this one. We were having this conversation today about this work. Um, it's a group of seven photographs untitled, these little girls in the museum. And it's not so much that I want to talk about this work, but about an idea that feels really essential to me in your work and something that I've continued to learn from you. Um, like in this work, it, there are these images of these two little girls sort of running around a natural history museum. It's the, the Hall of Man, of course. And it's like, the, you know, showing these different stages of progress of like our, you know, we're bipeds now, you know, we're standing upright, whatever that progress might be. But, um, what we were talking about is the idea that to have a criticality about the systems around you that are oppressive, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a negative that ends there. Having that criticality, taking note of the institutional structures around you, pointing them out and being critical about them is also a way to loosen their grip on you and to recognize the amount of slippage and agency you have within these confines. Um, something that has always struck me in your, in your work and that I um, strive for is um, both a, a razor sharp criticality and a sense of eternal optimism. That even within like the like, oh my God, the whole world is so fucked up. But here's this little, ooh, there's a little back door that we can like, and like maybe we can still have a good time in here. We could maybe move this around over here. And that that energy is also, is not, is not stupid. And that's not just like that the criticality is endlessly negative or that the optimism is a dumb optimism. It's actually about seeing where there can be breathing room within these structures. Um, and that feels like, a, to me, like what you've done in your book and what you do in your, in your practice is this kind of um, the energy to criticize clearly and well as a form of liberation. I mean, does that make any sense? Thank you very much. But I want to say reciprocally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does, of course. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> yes, it's, um, it's very important what you say. But I think that also we can go back to this place that, you know, that I have and we all have in front of works, in front of your works, which is what are that agency is also given by the works, which mm -hmm. have a criticality, but also if, you, if we want to listen to what they say, we have to practice a kind of emancipation. Mm -hmm. yeah? that's, that's what I learned from going so, to so many exhibitions, seeing so many works, mm -hmm. is that if you, if, if you are a be beholder, um, I don't think that beholder make works, mm -hmm. you know. 
I, th you know, that's an, th another discussion that's, we can stay we tuned. Can, okay, <laughs> we'll be back next week. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, like you know, in Philippe Thomas' work, beholders become kind of characters mm -hmm. within the works, mm -hmm. and this is for me, uh, you know, I, I I have to think about that more. But this is for me a way to practice emancipation. But to mm -hmm. get the lesson of the work is to become a character of the work, mm -hmm. and thus to be enabled to do, to do things mm -hmm. with the works. Mm -hmm. And should we, um, do you want to do the Roland Bart? What should we look at while you say it? Because the Roland Bart thing is important. Because there's of, also or, Tony or on in it. Front of, oh, that's where we wanted to end. That's right. OK, stay tuned, people. Here we go. Yeah, no, this is a good ending. So we had to skip over the Catherine Lord. Let's just look at it for one little second, because we don't want to give her short shrift. But yeah, an Just incredible work by Catherine Lord. Again, about silence and lips and talking, and but it's also the fact that I've noticed that during, I mean, the, the number of works that are untitled for someone or mm. for dedicated to someone since mm -hmm. thirty years has been more and more important, and I think it's really a way to getting out of modernism. Also, mm -hmm. to address a work to someone is suddenly completely sh uh, changing the relation mm -hmm. of the maker to the wor work made. Suddenly, mm -hmm. there is a third person there to whom the work is addressed. And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, you look mm -hmm. at Felix Gonzalez Torres, you look mm -hmm. at, you, you, so many works are dedicated to someone. And of course, it's very important in the age of AIDS to name names. Yeah, yeah. So there's all the And whole, also with all of these silent E's. Absolutely. Right? It's a, a, another kind of destabilization of yeah. history. I have so to add something have to, to the silent E's, yeah, you know. Please do. There's a very famous writer in France called Georges Perec, who's an incredible writer, Thank who you. gave protocols to his writings, and he wrote an entire book without those E's, which are everywhere. And in French, without E's, you say it, you voice it, sans ze, sans e. And of course, the e are, in his case, mm -hmm. his parents who died in the extermination right. camps. Right. In Auschwitz. Sans because e uh, is also them. Without them. So it's them. without them to say and sans e uh, is to so say without them. So it's again a dedication them. within the form of the work. Mm. And this is also something, yeah. you know, So without the about. e is also without them. Exactly. So the it's silence beautiful. e is also, mm. is, is really, you, you, you really went, were tackling the exact mm. thing when mm. you were talking mm. about the silent e's that are everywhere. Mm. And this morning when we were, uh, you know, believe me, there are so many other things we wanted to talk about, but we were uh, uh, sort of how, how do we bring it together? And um, Elizabeth brought up this beautiful Roland Barthes um, text, the starred text, and this idea of um, uh, the fragmented or the displaced, and that that as a formal as a kind of uh, a form in terms of thinking about how Elizabeth wrote her book or how I attempted to do a survey, which is to, to, to take away this kind of like the hard linear move forward that is about kind of adding up progression in one direction and kind of solidifying history, solidifying experience into history. The, the gesture of starring, of, of fracturing, of multiplicity, of um, a disco ball, right? That that fragmentariness, rather than it being a deficit, is actually a way to, um, to make the work alive right now. Yeah. Absolutely, and it's also, I think, the, 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 the notion of a retrospective, you know, adapt to a name, which mm -hmm. retrospective, you know, as it relates to the identity of an artist, mm -hmm. Zoe Leonard, for instance, you know. <laughs> for, or Philippe Thomas. Or Philippe Thomas, for instance, <laughs> the idea that the star text is also the star text of the I, of mm -hmm. the I, of exactly. both eyes and I, is also a way to think about the fact that, you know, 
with your retrospective, I see something like, and with my book, hopefully, I see something like an eye which is totally deconstructed, fragmented, spar you know, sparkling everywhere, but also not solidified, not identified. And at the end, when we go at the end of the show and we see you know, New Jersey, Hoboken, whatever, there is something which is reconstructed, mm -hmm. but not reconstructed as a solidified I again, but as something which stays with its voids, its fragments, mm. its rhythm, its space, mm. its speciality. Voila. Mais voila. <laughs> okay. We okay. should Thank open to question. Um, we had some so many other things to say. <laughs> I think we did good though. We got a lot done. Yeah. Questions? Question? We don't see you, it's very hard. I know, we gotta get out. Oh, we have so many pairs of glasses. The one, these are for close, they're not gonna help me. No. There's like for close, for far, for dark, for light, medium. Can you show, show us all your other slides? <laughs> Oh, there's Elizabeth looking at the thing. We managed to squeeze that in. You want to talk about it a bit? Catherine, my partner, but then there's also... <laughs> so it's very important for the scale and for the, the, the way you the, the work is displayed. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it? Um, uh, then, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A question. A question. A question. I'll break the ice. Uh, thanks very much for this talk. Uh, I, I guess it, uh, when you mentioned, you know, coming back now to the gag rule, you know, and that we're in danger again of having our speech sort of limited by government, I mean, I'm just curious to hear what you would have to say right now in terms of our job or our responsibility as people producing um, art, people producing subjectivities. How do you think we can move forward right now? I think we're in kind of a critical moment, especially here in this country, and I'd just be curious to hear your yeah. thoughts about this. Um, do you want to no, take I it mean, first? Yeah. or? Um, I mean, I have no idea what's going to work or what's going to be effective. My instinct is just keep working, like just keep working, keep talking, you know, both, both mouths, <laughs> um, get both mouths talking, um, all the mouths. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think like um, uh, actually AK, I remember right after the election, um, we had this conversation where you had a show coming up and you were like, oh my God, I don't know if I should do it, keep doing it, like, do I change it? How do I respond to this moment? Like this weight of responsibility of like, how do we incorporate this into our work? Do we have to change the kind of artist that we are in order to be effective in our time? And I think, I don't remember what you decided to do with that one show. And I think one can choose to make work that is topical to the moment, to these issues. But I just think that actually making the work, whatever that work might be, um, is incredibly um, vital, is vitally um, important, it's vitally significant. Because, um, I mean, there's a reason why during fascist, um, you know, uh, uprisings or government overthrows or takeovers that libraries are burned, that artifacts are destroyed, because it's, it's an incredibly powerful thing that we hold on to. Exactly. We, as human beings, we, we really cathect to artworks, to books. These form our 
the, the, the cosmologies in our mind, these are every bit as important as our physical bodies. And they're, these are the touchstones that we, that we turn to, the symbols we hang on to. And it's also how we communicate across time. This is what the next generation, okay, this government is gonna here and gone, and, but it's also how you communicate to the next generation. It's how you communicate to other people around the world that you want to say like hey we're over here and we're not agreeing with our government you know we're we're still we're still people over here um, that would like our borders to be more open or whatever but i don't think it always has to be topical i think it's the actual action of not letting the kind of manic moment to moment Twitter feed of insanity rule your day, but to say, look, I have a practice, I have a talent, I have a gift, I'm going to train myself, I'm going to educate myself, I'm going to sit at my desk, I'm going to write my, I'm going to make my film, I'm going to, whatever that is, like your practice um, is, is valuable. Um, yeah, that's what oh. I think. <laughs> It's always complicated, those questions, because also, you know, what, at, at least, since it's something that's going back to it, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and thinking today about 20 years ago, you know, my, the, the first chapter of my book is what were the technologies that were, we used at the time? Because I think it's always very important when you make an historical account to talk about the technologies that are at use. And we had, you know, we didn't have the internet. Right. We had photocopies, we had yeah. um, posters, we had the um, television, we had the fax. In France, we had a little thing called the Minitel, which was a kind of preform of a computer, but wasn't very useful. But, you know, it was like, <laughs> okay. We had uh, answering machines, we had, te I mean, Remember all the, the fax. Fax, you know, um, cassettes, recording, you know, the analog. Okay, mm -hmm. and so it's always, I think, to, to answer your question, I think this also has to be taken into account somewhat, you know, to think about the kind of inventory of the technologies that are at use. And this would complete what Zoe has just said, which is that it is very important to continue in a way that's not topical, in a way that's not to the, because this is where the, um, the lure is, that if you point to the topical, this is going to be uh, recuperated in those tweets. So it has to continue. You have to continue your work and then on the other time be conscious that, you know, it's another world, technological world. Mm -hmm. I think it's also an important fact too, yeah, or an important data to, to take into account. Right. But I also think with that, that there's something really interesting in activism right now, which has to do with the the relationship to the actual physical body. Definitely. And um, uh, I think what's possible in digital time and in kind of virtual communication and how um, it's, you know, it's so amazing how we can communicate and it's so different than the kind of work we had to do back then of like Xeroxing and like wouldn't do those, those remember those like fax things where we would like jam up the NIH's yeah. fax Zap machine? Zap fax. For hours Zap or whatever. Facts, we called that. And it's amazing what all these ways that people can be gathered so quickly or you can communicate so quickly. But there's also, I still really um, think there's something very special about physically sharing space, being in this room together. I love that things are streamed and that things are archived and that you can watch the video later. But being in a room together, something about the timber of voices, the body to bodiness of it, I find very, um, I think different. I mean, that was what Occupy Wall Street was also. Yes. Some of that power was about like bodies being together and the kind of the body needs to eat, the body needs to sleep, the body needs to be warm. Like the needs of the body are so they're so real, right? They're not in like an endless feed. It's like you're, it's a, 
it's your it's your body, <laughs> you know. And there's something I think very yes, valuable definitive. about also holding, not saying no, like oh, no, to no, the no. phone or to to, no, no, but no. to also remember the value of our physical presence with each other and the strength that we get um, from that body to body communication. Um, yeah. Now I suddenly want to start talking about dance and like yeah, yeah, live no, poetry. Nick Mouse's show and yeah. just let's No, no, I think it's also <laughs> a, a, a symptom yeah. also of our times that there's so many live events and so many o occasions, you know, mm. I don't know here but in Paris that every day there are um, symposium, conferences, readings. I mean, this this activity mm -hmm. of gathering together in the same space and listening actually mm -hmm. is or is really also something that has really, you know, been enhanced uh, since the past years. I think mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. same reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like the physical, like even a physical, it's different. But like an object, like a is different than reading on. There's something about yeah. like this, having this in your bag. Yes. You know. More? Hi, this is a question for um, each of you. <laughs> um, where would you say that um, you most, uh, most experience jouissance or joy or, or pleasure within your work as a whole, your practices? <laughs> Moira, that's a good question, but it's very hard to answer. <laughs> you could answer for each other. How about for you, Moira? Is that really super weird to ask? No, I'm curious. Um, well, it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately, and I. The other day I went to the Guggenheim and I kind of asked the same question to Maggie Nelson and Eileen Miles. Oh, wow. And, um... Well, that's <laughs> What did they say? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, did, I didn't think it was such yeah. a hard question. No, no, I'm happy to no. answer it, but I'm curious about for you. Do you... If well, you don't for say, me that's at cool. the moment, I, I'd say it's, it's when I'm behind a camera that's very difficult to operate. <laughs> Oh my God, that's hilarious! Yeah, <laughs> with a, it's with funny. A, it can a be subject, a live. Say subject. it again. With a live subject. With a live subject, huh? Wow. Go. I don't know. For me, it used to be. You know, my practice as a journalist, and I still do that, was to be sent by the worst train because Liberation didn't have <laughs> lots of money to a very far away uh, museum to see a show, and that was something which was incredibly jouissif, you know, just to go there, to see the work, and to begin to be a beholder. <laughs> I love mm. this term, yeah. because suddenly you're behold, I mean, there was something suddenly to become someone involved in the work. That would be, that was, used to be the, the best times. I have to say that, um, Putting together a book is also an incredible, mm -hmm. an incredible moment. And uh, we were talking the other day about the experience of making a book. You know, I don't do those things so much. I'm not. It's it's incredible. It's when this the the individual practice that you do totally silently and within yourself, totally you know restricted to yourself, becomes becomes something you're going to be sharing with others and binding again with others and trying to make something of an object with all that. I think it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's crazy. It's very, you're full of fear that, you know, mm. it's, it's not going to work, that this little collective making a book is not going to understand, but this is a moment of really incredible pleasure. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for me, I guess there's a couple of really different kinds of joy. And in a way, I got a little bit, um, was aware of something I've really been missing, which um, the, I really love like the daily, the dailiness of studio practice and getting bored and um, kind of this very, this really quiet time of um, 
taking pictures, editing, thinking, um, having these thoughts move around when there's not a deadline and when you're kind of like in this soup with them. And it, it can be very uncomfortable at moments, but there, you can kind of fall into a rhythm where your thoughts um, take a left turn and go somewhere unexpected, something that you read this morning. Like it's a very, it's a very private space. Um, making a show like the one upstairs, the effort of that took me completely away from that kind of practice for the last more than year, the last couple of years. Um, it's a real work of um, collaboration, negotiation, pragmatics, stanchions, light levels. It's a very different, you're in constant conversation and parts of that are very um, like hard to sustain for someone like me that's really used to having a lot of studio time where it's like me and the dog and like my thoughts. And But installing is great. I love to install. I've installed with a couple of people in this room. Elizabeth and I installed upstairs together. And it's so hard because you're tired. Like by the time you're installing, you've been cracking at it for so long, but you find this really weird new energy where, you know, and with Lynn, I've installed many times, like I, we work with dummies and you have like a, a roll of tape on your wrist and you just start taping up the dummies and moving them around. And it's where your ideas and the materiality of your work, like the thing you've made, yeah, falls into architecture in anticipation of someone else arriving. Exactly. So you're leaving those spaces for you, for the viewer, and you're starting to think about things as an experience. And um, it's, it's really difficult. You're always, you're always tired at that point. You're sort of pushing through. But it's such a full body kind of thinking. And like we would sort of be working and like we'd sort of sit down to see it from this angle and like, one of us would be too tired to get up and the other one would go and like move it and then the other one would come and you're sort of like, oh, I just had a better idea. Let me show it to you. And so it's like this conversation that's not about words. It's a spatial conversation and it's, oh boy, it's fun. It's, I, I fucking love it. I really do. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting back to some of the other part of like taking pictures and making a new work, which is a whole other kind of a pleasure that also involves a lot of pain. Um, they both, it's funny, that line yeah. um, between the pleasure and the pain, you know. I it's agree. a fine line, right? I agree. Oh, yeah. no. I noticed you didn't say, like, oh, the empty page. No, sure. <laughs> you weren't like, oh, when I sit down with an empty computer. Sure. No. <laughs> Je suis sans, <sorry, so. laughs> No, no. No, no. It's, I, I notice it's the same moment, that moment where suddenly you are sharing something with the others, and then there is a conversation, but it's before yeah. the thing is yeah. It's like the out. in and out of the closet. Voila. I was going to yeah. oh, You that. were going there? Voila. Sorry for cutting you off. No, it's yeah. OK. No, because it's that, that transitional yeah. point. It's very difficult, but it's like super exciting. In and out and in and out. That's a word. First of all, thank you. But going along with the, the theme of in and out of the closet and the silent E, there's a cyclicalness to this. The Diderot print uh, reminded me of in the 13th century, there were Beguines, collectives of women who had to stay under the church's radar by pretending to be semi-religious. But they were really artists. They were goldsmiths, they were saddlers, they were soap makers. And because they couldn't get into the guild because they were women, and they did, they did speak through their work, through their art, but what, a hundred years after that, when they were speaking perhaps too much, had too much knowledge, what were they called then? Witches. And the, the um, overriding organization, as you started out with, is like, why are there no great women, ar women artists? We get, too, what, maybe perhaps too much voice, 
and you get the work out there and you do the goldsmithing and you do the sadly and it's like, oh, wait a minute, you know too much. So there's, an, there's the oppression comes back or resurfaces. So given the organization, as when you started out this discussion, what do we do then? Yes, we're, we're all producing and happy in our, our little fields, but what about the power structure? It's the power that's there that within this organization even now. How do we, how do, we do that? I mean, I know this is unanswerable, but the Beguines I have always loved, and the Diderot showed me that. I wish, I am in love with all of them. I wish I had known them for their, their courage to exist as femme sole, women alone. Yeah, there was a very beautiful show in uh, Belgium 20 years ago about uh, the works of the Begin with incredible text in the catalog by Chris Teva and uh, Lucie Rigaray talking about this, this world of the beginage and the begin. So thank you for, for saying that. About your question, is there a question, by the way? <laughs> How do we Very embarrassed. Lament? By the power. Sorry? It's a lament. A lament about a lament. power structure. Mm. I think we're um, doing it right now. I mean, that might sound really um, Pollyanna or something. Um, but. I don't know, you do, you do your work and you talk about these problems and I don't know, I feel like I'm always looking for that little fissure and I wouldn't call myself an activist these days. I haven't done anything I would consider activism in many years, but with, with our voices, I, I mean, don't you think yeah. it's gotta like, it's gotta make, it's gotta be, it's gotta be changing something slow, Oh my God, slow, slow, backwards sometimes, but I Should we tell them about our projects? Yeah. The, the captions? Yeah, um, yeah. I think uh, the next, I mean, my next project, our next project yeah, yeah. as a collective, and I invite you to yeah. do that, is to re rewrite all captions. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about power, you have the name of the author, of the father, <laughs> the title of the work, the date, I mean, all these things, why? Couldn't they be thought about otherwise, other narratives, other ways of dealing with that power? I think it's a project. It's an answer. <laughs> I also, I have an, another answer, which is a, a bit more theoretical, I should say. Um, that goes back to the 70s, you know. In the 70s, there was a group of people um, who were coming from Marxism, but also thinking, you know, a, away from Marxism. And they invented um, a group called Les Révoltes Logiques, the Logical Revolts. Their aim was to totally destroy Bourdieu's sociology. <laughs> What was Bourdieu sociology? It was a sociology that was actually very important, that would actually see the power relation as something which was reproducing itself eternally in a way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were, if you are from a certain class, you will not access to a certain number of things, education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Although we have to believe those things. This group, Les Révoltes Logiques, was saying it is very important to state what it is, but how can you change it? How can you not see that the workers are alienated? But, you know, in the 19th century, and I'm thinking about Rancière's work, which is very, very important for me, those workers were using their nights to produce poetry, to write. Mm. And why shouldn't we study those writings, those poetry, mm. too? Okay, that's my answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we're gonna get set up for with some wine and with books and um, mingle, talk to each other. Um, thanks for coming.